But you see, in America, my government wants this little one to grow up to go kill this little one over my dead body. I am not having it. I said the Pledge of Allegiance enough times, K through 12, that I believe in liberty and justice for all. It's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Daya Waspi. She's an internationally known speaker and activist. She's born in the United States to an American Jewish mother and an Iraqi Muslim father. She lived in Iraq as a child, returned to the U.S. at age five. After graduating from Swarthmore College with a B.A. in biology in 1993, she earned a medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania in 1997. Dr. Waspi has made two trips to Iraq to visit her extended family since the 2003 shock and awe invasion including a three-month stay in Basra in the spring of 2006. She brought her eyewitness account of life under occupation to over 200 audiences in 23 U.S. states, also the Capitol Hill in D.C., Ontario and British Columbia, and Madrid, Spain in 2007, and the third international Iraq conference in Berlin, Germany in March 2008. Based on her experiences, Dr. Waspi is speaking out in support of immediate, unconditional withdrawal of American forces from Iraq and Afghanistan, and the need to end the occupation from the Nile to the Euphrates. She is currently working on a book. Her website is www.liberatethis.com. Please join me in welcoming my friend, Dr. Dahlia Waspi. Thank you so much. I told Jim and Heidi that as soon as I went to Canada, I was internationally known, so that's my vibe. <laughs> I'm showing you this picture uh, because I grew up most of my life in Delaware. I was born in New York. Um, and uh, of course, Joe Biden, now vice president, was senator from Delaware for many years. And you know, we're a little bit slower in Delaware. Delaware has three counties, one, two, three. So it's just easier for Joe Biden to understand Iraq if it's divided into one, two, three. So it's really, this is for his purposes only, but it really should be up to Iraqis what happens there. Um, here on this map, you will see that uh, al-Basra is down here. This is the city where my father is from. Uh, my father uh, unusually likes American country music, and we think it's because he's from the South. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was a good one. <laughs> All right, so you could have been anywhere tonight uh, other than hearing about a humanitarian catastrophe, so I really appreciate that y'all came out tonight. Most of what my website is for is to document what I'm telling you because it's so vastly different from what the mainstream media will tell you. We do not know who is killing us, but we do know who is responsible for our safety. This is a quote from a man who lived in Baghdad in 2007 on a day when six consecutive car bombs went off in Baghdad. And Iraqis are saying, we don't know who is causing all the violence, but we know who's not protecting us, who is required by law to protect us, and that would be the occupying forces. So very special thank you for the venue, Texas State Employees Union. Uh, thank you, Texas Labor Against War and Code Pink Austin for helping to sponsor. And actually, I am here in Austin uh, this weekend, actually, for a press conference tomorrow morning that will be held at Under the Hood Cafe in Killeen, outside of Fort Hood. So, um, so thanks, everybody, for bringing me here. And thank you again for coming out. There are different ways to approach my talks, and this is what I picked for tonight. Basically, the purpose is for you to feel the weight of the occupation. In March of 2004, at the Radio and Television Correspondents Association dinner, this is a year after the illegal shock and awe invasion of Iraq. Uh, about 500 American soldiers officially are dead. Uh, about uh, 100,000 Iraqis are dead. And at the dinner, traditionally, the president does a comedy routine. And so he and his staff thought it would be funny if they took pictures of him searching the Oval Office saying those weapons of mass destruction have got to be here somewhere. And at the time of that dinner, a lot of people in the audience uh, thought that was pretty funny. But probably this young man didn't think it was funny because he was sent to fight a war based on lies and stepped on a landmine and lost his right arm and both his legs, 21 years old. And this young man probably was not laughing at that joke. RPG went through his right leg. His life now forever changed for a war based on lies. And I doubt this British soldier is laughing as he's trying to escape with his life from his burning tank in Basra. And for Iraqis, you have now seven years of blood running in the streets, 
and constant violence. So what I'm going to cover with you tonight, first a little bit of background uh, about the history of Iraq. We'll move on to the devastation of the first Gulf War, which most of us don't hear that much about. We'll move on to the current phase of the war on terror, why we're there and why are we continuing there as condition, conditions get worse and worse and worse. And finally, a goal of ending the illegal occupation so that the healing can begin. So let us begin with the background. The region of Iraq is ancient Mesopotamia. This is the region known, if you could see this area, known as the Fertile Crescent, really more like the Fertile Question Mark, but I'll take Crescent here. You can see it runs along the waterways of the Tigris and Euphrates and over to the Mediterranean Sea. And also in this image from between 2000 and 3000 BC, you see the major uh, early cities of civilization. Babylon, here's Ur down here, um, and Mosul is there at that time, and Nineveh. And over here, just as a reference point, this is Palestine. Israel was a state created in 1948. So that was Mesopotamia, land between two rivers. This is where the original Garden of Eden is believed to have been. There is actually in southern Iraq, there is uh, a descendant of the tree, the famous tree, um, which in the 1920s when the British were there, uh, one of the soldiers broke off a branch and there were huge diplomatic issues um, with, uh, he had to be punished accordingly because the population was quite upset about that. Now, uh, Abraham was from the city of Ur, Abraham, father of the three major monotheistic religions. Now, my dad says Abraham is an Iraqi. That might be pushing it a little bit, but nevertheless, this is a connection that many of us have to this part of the world. As I mentioned, the cradle of civilization, the Babylonians, Sumerians, Akkadians, Assyrians, these are the people, the ancestors of who lives in Iraq today, the people who developed the concept of the 24-hour day, the first system of writing, the basis of mathematics. These are, of course, Arabic numerals that we use. The bases of law, science, and medicine, 7,000 years of civilization, all accomplished without the help of any Americans or any British. It's true. Now, this is a pictorial of what the Hanging Gardens of Babylon may have looked like, built by Nebuchadnezzar II in 600 BC, uh, for many years recognized as one of the seven wonders <coughs> of the world. This was not built by Halliburton. So again, if you're concerned about the reconstruction of Iraq after American forces leave, I am confident that the descendants of the people who did this can probably throw something together. With an Arab father and Jewish mother, now this gets confusing because we're trained to think of everything as separate. There are Arab Jews, but those are considered Sephardic Jews. My mom is uh, Ashkenazi, so that's European Jewry. Uh, her parents were from, uh, from Austria. So with an Arab father and Ashkenazi Jewish mother, I am 100% Semite, which means that you can insult either side of my family, and that would be anti-Semitic, but let's wait for the Q&A. But in 1980, the Iran-Iraq war started. That lasted for eight years. And my dad was sort of considering going back at that time, um, but there's more details that make it complicated. It'll all be in the book. Um, but uh, I was then a junior in high school. My sister was in college. Before you know it, August 2nd, 1990 rolled around. The Iraqi troops moved into Kuwait. Uh, then economic sanctions were imposed. Uh, six months later, the Gulf War was launched. Uh, then sanctions continued for 13 years. Then shock and awe came, and I was like, we keep waiting for things to get better, <coughs> and they keep getting worse. So I'm going to go. So in 2004, I went back for a 19-day trip which was really stupid because there was no government, there was no law and order, but it turned out to be the safest time to go. Um, and I visited Baghdad for the first time. I also made it down to Basra where my father is from. My dad was one of 10 kids. His mother was Sunni, his father was Shia. 10 kids between them, okay, something worked out all right, but uh, there are no jobs in Iraq today. So, and this is the problem is that, uh, is that the young people of Iraq are being blocked from contributing to their society. And so what happens to many people, uh, um, many of the young men, is that they join the army or police. This is the best way I can show you of the toll of American foreign policy on the Iraqi people. Saddam Hussein got fat during the years of sanctions. There's no love lost there. It was the same people who suffer everywhere. We are now the five-year anniversary of Katrina. 